Dr. Tom Constable is a graduate of uh, Moody Bible Institute as well as Dallas Theological Seminary. He taught here for uh, 45 years, from 1966 until he retired from full-time service in 2011. And during that time, he taught pastoral ministry, Christian education, theology, and Bible exposition courses. He may be the one person who is taught in more departments than anybody else, we're not sure. He's the founder of uh, Dallas Seminary's Field Education Department that has morphed into different names, I'm sure. The Center for Biblical Studies back in 1973, both of which he directed for many years before assuming other responsibilities. He also founded and directed the Lay Institute for 12 years and directed the DMIN program for 17 years. Uh, he served in Bible exposition for 13 years. He's ministered in almost three dozen countries. He's written commentaries on every single book of the Bible. And those are available both in hard copy as well as uh, they're free on the internet at sonniclight.com. Everywhere I travel, people tell me how useful that is for their ministry and uh, pastors and teachers alike. And uh, it's been a great tool. He's married to his wife, Mary, and they together founded Plano Bible Chapel in Plano, Texas, which will celebrate its 50th anniversary as a church this year. Mary, welcome. You're sitting there next to Tom. Would you uh, welcome her and welcome him as Tom Constable comes to speak to us in chapel today? Well, it's great to be back at DTS. <clears throat> as uh, President Bailey mentioned, I retired seven years ago to uh, give myself to a full-time writing ministry. And uh, this is the first time I've been back to speak in chapel, so it's great to see some old friends on the faculty and some new friends in the student body. Uh, it's one of the great things about teaching at Dallas for Mary and me has been the rela relationships that we've been able to establish with both faculty and students, some of which have been lifelong and uh, some of my former students still call us regularly, and uh, we feel that those relationships are just gifts from God that are irreplaceable. And I know that you will form relationships like that while you're a student here, and I would encourage you to do that, not only with your fellow students, but with the faculty who are genuinely interested in you as people and not just uh, you as, as, as students. One of the pillars on which Dallas Seminary was built is prayer. Uh, throughout its history, the men and women who have been associated with this school have believed in and practiced prayer. We have a strong heritage of prayer. I like to think of prayer as one of the legs on which the Christian walks through life, the other being the Word of God. Uh, you will get much encouragement and help while you're a student here in understanding and valuing the scriptures. You will not get as much help when it comes to prayer. Amen. You will be responsible to develop habits of prayer in your life that will make you a man or woman of God pretty much on your own. But my prayer for this chapel service is that I will be able to encourage you to do that, to establish habits in your life that will result in your becoming a man or woman of prayer. As an illustration of how important prayer was to the founder of our school, Dr. Lewis Perry Chafer, and to the history of our school, listen to this incident that President Campbell wrote. In the spring of 1924, plans were being made for a new seminary to be organized in Dallas to emphasize, above all else, the teaching of the Bible itself. Lewis Perry Chafer, president-elect, had gone to Dundee, Scotland to hold evangelistic meetings at the invitation of a leading manufacturer of that city in whose home he was a guest. 
related Dr. Chafer, at four o'clock on a never to be forgotten morning, I was awakened with a sense of deep foreboding with regard to the agreement reached in Dallas. It seemed as if an unbearable burden had been thrust upon me. Failure, probable if not certain, was the only thing I could see. And all the forebodings of the powers of darkness came rolling like billows over me. In great agony of spirit, I cried to God, saying I could not go through the day without some very definite indication of his will in this matter. If such indication were not given, I should have, been, I should have to cable to Dallas requesting them to discontinue the whole project. Following that prayer, I fell asleep. And later, seated by my host at the breakfast table, was surprised by his asking whether he had any provision in view for the library, which would be needed for the new seminary. I told him that we had not, but that since Dr. Griffith Thomas had just died, whose loss we were mourning on both sides of the Atlantic, I had written to our constituency in Dallas asking them to pray definitely that his valuable reference library might be secured for the, for the school. I'm interested in what you've told me, he replied, and would like you to purchase these books and send the bill to me. And do not drive too close a bargain. I wish to pay whatever the library is worth. A little later that same morning, I had retired to the study when my host came in and said, speaking of the school, what about your salary as president? I at once told him that I had not expected to draw any salary. Nothing was, was farther from my thoughts. You will need some financial help, he replied. And though I cannot give you all that would be expected for one in such a position in the United States, I wish to send you personally $2,000 a year. Truly my cup ran over. The gift of a library valued at $4,000 and such unexpected provision for my salary all in one day, could I doubt God desired the Evangelical Theological College to go ahead. What a story. Well, our Lord had more to say on the subject of prayer than any other character in the Bible. He not only modeled what it looked like to be a man of prayer, but he gave his disciples instructions about how to pray and he encouraged them to pray. And one of his parables that encourages prayer is found in Luke chapter 11. So I'd invite you to turn there if you have a Bible with you. After his disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he gave them instructions about what to pray for in verses one through four of Luke 11. Among other things, he taught them to ask their heavenly father for what they needed Give us this day our daily bread. He followed this instruction with a parable that encourages his disciples to ask their heavenly father for their daily needs in verses 5 through 13. And he said to them, verse 5, Suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Very inconvenient time to go knocking on a neighbor's door asking for food. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. In that culture, hospitality was very high on people's priority lists. And if you could not provide some refreshment for guests who dropped in, it was a shameful thing. You lost face. And from inside he shall answer and say, do not bother me. The door has been shut. I and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Friendship has its limits after all. <laughs> 
I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now there's a difference among the translators as to how they should render the Greek word translated shamelessness. In some translations, you'll find perseverance. In others, you find shamelessness. I go with the shamelessness crowd myself. I think that's the better rendering. And uh, so Jesus says, because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Some time ago, I was uh, noticing that our pantry door in our house was leaning and uh, wouldn't close all the way. And um, as I contemplated this problem, I thought, well, this is something I can fix. I'm a pretty handy guy around the house. I take care of problems like this. I've done so in the past, so I'll just take the door down and I'll plane the edge and put it back up and we'll be back in business in no time. Uh, but then I remembered that I'd done that a uh, few years back, and uh, sometime after that, the door again leaned further, and I had to take it off again and do more planing. I really hadn't fixed the problem. So I said, well, maybe this time I'll take the frame off and replace the whole frame around the door. But if I do that, I'll probably have to do some plastering around the frame and repaint part of the wall. This is going to be a big job <laughs> and an expensive job. And then I remembered my friend Mert. Merton uh, has built and rebuilt many houses in his career as a remodeler. So I called Mert and asked him to come over. He looked at the door and he said, no problem. He went out to his truck, he came back with a screwdriver and one three-inch screw. He proceeded to take out one of the screws on the upper hinge and replace it with his long screw that tied into the stud behind the frame and pulled the whole assembly back into line. What took him five minutes would have taken me a week <laughs> and quite a few bucks to fix. How glad I was that I had asked for Mert's help. And that's precisely the point that Jesus is making with this parable. We need to ask God for help, even though we feel ashamed doing it. He wants us to humble ourselves and to ask for his help because our Heavenly Father will, without fail, give only what is best to his children who ask for him from him in prayer. Jesus went on, I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. No matter how intense we feel or how lack of intense we feel when we pray, Jesus says, keep on doing it. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. You see, this is a strong encouragement to bother God with our prayers. <laughs> Someone asked G. Campbell Morgan, the famous British preacher, this question after he had finished one of his messages. A lady came forward and she said, Dr. Morgan, do you think I ought to bother God with the little things in my life or just pray about the big things? 
And he said, Madam, do you think anything in your life is little, is big to God? <laughs> of course not. Nothing is too difficult for him. He wants us to bother him with what concerns us. Now, what, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? God is not malicious. He's not deceptive. He doesn't slip us a mickey when we ask for something in prayer that's going to bite us. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now notice the difference here. In the parable, he was talking about a friend rising to help his friend at night. But now, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to his children? At the beginning of this teaching, in verse 2, Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. God wants to think of, uh, Jesus wants to think of God as our Father when we come to him in prayer because that's how he relates to us in prayer. He loves us like a father loves his children and he doesn't mind being bothered. He just wants us to do it, like the Nike slogan says. Just do it. <laughs> That's the point. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but my biggest problem with prayer is that I forget to do it. I'd like to do more of it, but I come to the end of the day, and uh, lo and behold, I haven't done that much of it. Paul wrote that we ought to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. By the way, that word without ceasing is translated elsewhere. Uh, it's used to describe a hacking cough. The idea is not that God wants us to be praying all the time that we're awake um, without inter interruption, but he wants us to come back to it often during the day like a person who has a hacking cough, coughs. <laughs> but I pray much less than I should, and I suspect that you do too. How can we remember to pray about everything? After all, Paul exhorted us to do that, didn't he? Philippians 4, 6. Uh, he said, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Well, here's something that has helped me. I inserted the text, Pray Without Ceasing, on a picture that I imported into my computer and put on the desk page. I use my computer a lot, as you do. And whenever I look at the desktop, I see that verse. And it reminds me to pray. The same thing can be done on a smartphone or a tablet. Many of you carry phones with you and you check your phone frequently throughout the day. If you have developed the habit of doing that, you can form the habit of talking to your Heavenly Father frequently as you go through the day. Amen. Well, why does God want us to pray without ceasing? First, because he loves us and he loves to hear from us. We are his children. He desires our fellowship. Your fellowship with God is much more important to him than it is to you. As amazing as that sounds, the scripture reveals that that is the case. God loves us so much that he wants to hear from us. Parents like to hear from their children throughout the day. They like to get phone calls from the kids. 
They like to get checked out. They like that contact, whether it's electronic or personal. And so does God. He loves us so much that he wants, to talk to, wants us to talk to him frequently. Second, we should pray without ceasing because there are things that God will do for us if we ask him to do them that he won't do if we don't ask. James 4.2 says, you have not because you ask not. There are things that parents will do for their children if their children ask them that they will not do if the children don't ask. And God acts the same way. Third, we should pray without ceasing because we are totally dependent on God for everything in our lives. You will not take another breath. You will not take another step. Your heart will not beat one more time unless God sustains you. You are that dependent upon him. Without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. We are totally dependent upon him. And unless God enables us to do what we need to do, we cannot do it. We need his help as we go through every daily activity. But is it really true that God, our Heavenly Father, will without fail give only good gifts to his children who ask from him in prayer? Is that true? Why does God give some people autistic children? Why do some people have, uh, have uh, unsympathetic spouses when they want to serve the Lord? Why do some people have ongoing financial problems year after year? Why do some problems have a people have some thorn in the flesh that they just can't get rid of? Well, as the years unfold, we realize that these were good gifts because God will use them to make something beautiful of our lives. Your irritating gift may be the grain of sand in the oyster of your life that God uses to produce a pearl of great price. Just like he said with the Apostle Paul. Just like the Apostle Paul learned with his thorn in the flesh. And Dr. Chafer learned with his ongoing financial needs, both personally and as the president of a seminary. Just as John Wesley learned, whose spouse was so unsupportive that she was antagonistic to his ministry. Just like Joni Tata Erickson learned when she experienced a debilitating accident early in her life. In the early years of the seminary, Dr. Harry Ironside used to come to this campus to deliver what was called special Bible lectures. And uh, one year when he was here, uh, he was meeting with the faculty for their weekly prayer time. The faculty then and now meets for prayer every week and prays for the needs of the school and the needs of the students that they are aware of. Well, at that time, the seminary was going through one of its perpetual financial crises. It didn't have enough money to pay the employees regularly. Many times the employees had to go home with no pay and no hope of pay. And so the faculty was praying about this need and Dr. Ironside prayed, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Won't you please sell some of those cattle and send us the money? <laughs> Yes. 
Before the meeting was over, a secretary came into the meeting room and she said, a cattleman in West Texas <laughs> has just sent a check because she has sold, he has sold some of his cattle <laughs> and he wants the seminary to have it. And it was for exactly what was needed. When I was a student here, um, some of my classmates would go to their boxes and find checks unexpectedly that would help them pay their bill. That never happened to me. <laughs> but God provided for me in another way. The first four automobiles that I owned were gifts from somebody else. So God is infinitely creative in the way he meets our needs. But our Heavenly Father will, without fail, give only what is best to his children who ask from him in prayer. So just do it. <laughs> <laughs>